you know, I have this whole thing on my phone about saying wavelengths until the Tuesday in Spanish, but I, it just does not seem like the right day. And what also doesn't seem like the right day is the bingo balls. So Tofa, you'll be off the hook next week, but I say <laughs> next Tuesday, we go double or nothing. So if we get a hundred next week, two weeks in a row, you got to be nice. All right, fine. We're not getting a hundred. Obviously, Andrew Tolo is here. Bryce Martino is back. Yeah, I mean, little three-man crew again. Worked well for the first couple minutes of Sundays. And then, you know, we had Jacob, which was great. Long time he's been away. But uh, yeah, let's just talk about some football, huh? Let's do it. Who wants to talk about a draft pick from 2021 that after a month and a half, their team is regretting? Well, I think you could go a couple ways here. Um, We haven't seen a ton of star studded production from um, first round picks. And um, as I'm, as I'm scrolling through teams, I, the first one that catches my eye is someone that I was really high on. And um, that's the dolphins with Jalen Phillips. And I, I don't want to kick the bucket on him yet, but it's week six and he is not was, but is the, the most pro ready pass rusher in the class. And if you look at his snap count, he's not getting as much as many opportunities as you'd want to see him get. And he's sitting behind guys like Sam McGuavion, who who's been a career rotational guy. Um, he's not putting up big numbers. I think he has a sack, maybe a sack and a half. Um, on the season and when I do look at his tape a little bit he almost looks slow like his technique is there um, but he he looks like he's just kind of going through the motions instead of playing his ferocious aggressive style that we all know and love and and that the Dolphins drafted him for so um, for me I would say on the on the defensive side of the ball it would probably be Jalen Phillips and on the offensive side of the ball this one's probably a little bit tougher. Um, I could go, I could go a few ways here. Um, I think one that that I might be regretting is uh, Justin Fields, another guy I'm not ready to kick the bucket on, but he just hasn't looked stellar. Preseason was all exciting. It's fun to see a young uh, face of the franchise guy who's um, a dual threat. He's electric, but um, he's just, he's thrown a pick in two of his three games where he's had starting reps and uh, he's two, two interceptions, two touchdowns in, hasn't thrown for over 210 yards. Um, I think he has an awful O line and not a ton of um, receiving help. I'm just, I'm not super impressed with his production thus far. And uh uh, as the saying goes, if, if they're going to bite as a dog, they'll bite as a puppy. And I'm just not seeing much of that right now from Justin Fields. I, I don't know. I want to say Mac Jones just because it, it aligns with my anti-patriotism. <laughs> but if, if, if it's too soon for Justin Fields, then it's too soon for Mac. I don't know about like regretting but I feel like the Dolphins kind of wish that they had two years ago, first round pick back maybe the Tua Mm -hmm. and then doubling down and getting Jalen Waddle. But I, I mean, I don't know. Time will tell with them. Other than that, I feel like a lot of teams that went defense, like they're happy with their decisions after a month and a half. Well, uh, don't get me wrong, Tyson Campbell's a good corner, but I think they probably could have gotten someone like uh, Asante Samuel Jr. instead. Uh, Samuel Jr. is more of a ball hawk corner, which we've seen it before in these uh, in a few of these games. They need some of those turnovers. Tyson Campbell just hasn't really given them those turnovers. He's been good in coverage still, but I think they just need more from him. Another one is probably Peyton 
Saints uh, taking Peyton Turner. I know Andrew's going to love me for that, but hasn't really produced like any any of us hoped. Because he's played three games and he has three tackles for loss and a sack. But continue. Yeah, I mean, Greg Rousseau is a better prospect. I'll leave it at I, that. Oh, well, prospect maybe not, but I think he's playing better for sure. Well, yeah. I, I might even say that he was a better prospect coming out of college. Um, I mean, he I, had a 15 sack year back in 2019. Yeah, right. And it was off of like one or two moves, but the fact that you can get that production off of a limited skill set is definitely something. Right. I like your Tyson Campbell pick. I think he was a freak athlete coming out of college and uh, he had great man coverage skills. But the concern, you know, the number one thing that you put is that he just he's never focused on the ball. He doesn't care where it is, um, whether uh, the quarterback's dealing to the other side of the field or to his receiver. He only cares about locking down who's in front of him, which I guess that's a good mindset. But um, you're expected to do more than that in the league. Um, and, and yeah, I, I don't think he's a bad pick necessarily. But no, it's not a terrible pick. Uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and Asante Samuel would have been the better pick. He's not a terrible pick, but you just could have gotten more from a different draft pick instead. Right. No, I totally More agree. production. I'm going to call an audible here. What's a free agent <clears throat> signing that a team regrets after the first six weeks? Kenny Galladay to the Giants. I, uh, I have that yeah. one ready. I feel like I was – I mean, I've talked about it a couple times on this pod. I was so high on the Giants coming into the season. I was like they could actually be like a wild card team or just take a big leap. And, um, I mean, he's been injured, which the most important ability is availability, and he just hasn't been there. And when he is on the field, he just doesn't have that connection with Daniel Jones that you're hoping for. And um, his performance is a little bit lackluster. He doesn't have the route running. Um, that we saw in Detroit and his big play jump ball ability. I've only seen a couple times this year. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's Jason Garrett being Jason Garrett and misusing good players or Sterling Shepard, Evan Engram and Darius Slayton and Kadarius Tony have just been outplaying him because frankly, on some reps, it looks like he is the worst receiver on the field. Um, plus what, what was that contract? I mean, that's a massive contract. That's a wide receiver one contract who is top 10 in the league in yardage right now and touchdowns, and he's neither. So I've just been disappointed across the board with almost everything that has to do with Galladay. What about you, Bryce? I would have said Galladay, honestly. Yeah, I just lost my train of thought here. Hold on. And I just forgot who I was going to say. All right, so while Bryce thinks oh, yeah. of that. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, it's not really so much of a free agent signing, but like the Julio Jones trade, he hasn't really panned out for him. I know he's been hurt, but he's got 263 yards and no touchdowns yet through six games of the year. Yeah, I guess like an offseason move that flopped. Yeah. How many coaches in the league do you think Mike Rabel could beat up? Paul, the better question is, what coaches could beat up Mike Vrabel? I'd like Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell. I'd like Robert Sala. Not really, like, but I think I think Sala would give him a good fight. I think Dan Campbell could could bite. Oh, bite off his knees. I don't know. I I always think back to um, God. I forget whose pro day it was, but Mike Vrabel had no pads, no helmets, and he was like straight up tackling players and like blocking them and stuff and like taking them through drills off of like pure testosterone and Red Bull. Like, I think Mike Rabel's a tough dude. Didn't um, Rabel like tear his ACL since he was coach? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 yeah like, he was like badly crazy. hurt. So I don't know. I, so we're I saying might take less Dan than Campbell, though. I think Dan Campbell is like minus 120, though. It's close. What about you think Sean McDermott could beat up Mike Rabel? No. No, he he couldn't. What about on the football field, Bryce? Yes. Think- yeah. <laughs> 100%. Uh, well, I mean, do you think the Titans outcoached or outplayed the Bills yesterday? Well, I think they outran them because, you know, they got a 250-pound I- Mack truck. 
I yeah. think it was more coaching than anything because when you look back on it, we the offense had two hundred or three fifty yards passing, three touchdowns. You can't really put the blame on the offense. Maybe the offensive line, definitely the offensive line, but. I think the defensive game plan just was terrible. You didn't get any sacks, got a few pressures here and there, but nothing to count into anything. Yeah. So you think fourth, four, fourth and one call excluded, they were outcoached? Yeah, they were bad. They're badly outcoached. Oh, okay. Bryce, I want to ask you, because you live and die with every snap number 17 from Wyoming takes – does Josh Allen playing like Ryan Fitzpatrick like scare you at all? Because I'm supposed to, like I'm, suppo- I'm supposed to not like the guy, and when he's like diving head first for first downs and doing hurdles and stuff, I'm <laughs> like, awesome. this is terrible. Like, yeah, I, I, you know? I understand he wants to win desperately, and you know, good for him and good for Buffalo, but I don't know how much I want to see him doing that. Yeah, you definitely want to limit the amount of hits and hurdles and whatever he takes but it was third and what six probably he's not going to pick up first just by sliding you have he's in win now mode he wants to win that game he's going to do whatever he takes enough for anything that that third down or whatever he jumped for and landed on his head or whatever I think he got but that was just me he did I, I I don't know. I'm in the minority. I found out I would have kicked it. You got Tyler Bass. You know he's going to make it. If you think you're going to lose, take your chance in overtime. Or you get can't the ball go back to overtime, overtime with Derrick Henry though. The way he was running against yeah. us, can't. But I guess for Buffalo, they know that they play in a terrible division and they know that they're going to win a bunch of games. So if they lose one, oh, yeah, our next in four or five games are pretty easy. I mean, yeah. do the Bills normally struggle with rushing attacks? I know everyone struggles <clears throat> with Derrick Henry, but we were bad against run last year. Everyone was just outrunning us by quite a bit. This year was a little different, but we haven't been playing against very many good backs besides Najee Harris, so can't really uh judge too much from this year just yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean I think when I was watching it just it seemed like Derrick Henry always had a hole to hit and thing he didn't is, have to like manufacture big runs. If if you take out that 76 yard TD run, which should have been called back with two holds, he would have had 67 yards on 19 carries. So besides that, we held Derrick Henry to a pretty good game. Yeah. We did pretty good against him. I know you could talk about Buffalo forever, Bryce, but yes, unfortunately we are an unbiased podcast and we have to cater to everybody. But the last <laughs> Buffalo question, does Josh Allen being the leading rusher concern you? Yes. Yes, definitely. We, we don't have a running back on this team. I mean, we like to use Singletary and Zach Moss pretty much evenly, but Zach Moss they're only situational. Maybe three. Yeah. They've only had he only had three yards per carry, which was and he he ran the ball more times than Singletary did, which is just brutal. Singletary might have had 30, 40 yards the whole game, too. I mean, I don't even think they need like a a Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, like dual threat. I think if they, they just could need get a better someone running back. that could literally put his nose down and rush for a hundred yards a game, like on which 20, would have been Najee Harris. Car- yeah. No, like a guy like Najee, like if there was someone who just played <clears throat> smash mouth on the ground, they don't need to get 11 receptions a game. Like they are just there to establish a run game. Like who's going to beat the bills? No one. I mean, it's clear that our passing game or we're a passing team, but you still need to be pretty Absolutely. consistent with a run, which we haven't showed we have a good run game since uh, Singletary broke off that 40-yard TD mm-hmm. run against Miami. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember even in the preseason this year that Singletary was like – That guy. Yeah, like like he was supposed to be the back. And, and now he's not doing it's anything. It's just lackluster. So. Let's take a quick – 
halftime here. Bryce, I'm going to let you catch your breath. Tolva, who's winning the NBA Finals? Oh, great. Um, <laughs> X, if you're listening to this, I already know that I don't know as much as you. Um, let me uh, make myself sound a little bit smarter. I am trying to really get into the NBA. I want to have a second sport to write about. And so I'm, I'm learning more and more and more and more every day. I think the Nets are in the mix. I think the Lakers are in the mix. I think that the Bucks are in the mix. I think that the Heat are in the mix. And I think that the Bulls are in the mix and the Suns. So those are my six teams that I think are in the mix. I like um, Miami a lot. I think they have a lot of leadership there and a lot of athleticism with Bam Adebayo at, at center. And um, I think I, I really like the addition of Kyle Lowry on the leadership and shooting and dealing side of things. And I think it allows Jimmy Butler to be more of himself. Um, so I think my team right now might be um, my team right now is probably the Lakers, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if the heat or the bulls went, went far. I don't, I don't, I just have a, a feeling in my gut that the Suns aren't going to go as far as they did last year. All right, so if you worked for a four-letter network that's in a lot of homes, you would be, you know, pretty on par with their analysts. They all pick the same four teams, and it's really annoying. All right, I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's no, it's not. No, it's fine because <laughs> they all pick the same. So, like, you sound like you're them. If you didn't right. say you didn't know about the NBA, like I wouldn't have known. Um, I don't know as much. I know about the NBA. I don't think I know as much as. Um, I don't feel like I'm comfortable to like write articles yet and convince people that I am a genius. I think I'm a football genius. I don't think I'm an NBA genius yet. It's fine. It's and I'm humble enough 82. to admit it. Yeah. There you go. All right. Now into the real meat and potatoes of today's podcast. We're talking about Adam Sandler movies. This is great. Tolva, I just sprung this one on you, so I'm going to let you get some time to go up and down Rotten Tomatoes and think about it. Bryce, you and I have been thinking about this one for a while, so give me an Adam Sandler movie, give me an NFL team comparison, and please elaborate for the class. Well, Grown Ups 2 and Buffalo Bills, and here's why. Their first uh, Grown Ups movie was significantly better, in my opinion. First month of uh, the season for Buffalo was significantly better than uh, right now. Um, you had two shutouts with the Bills. I know we already talked about this at length earlier, but you had two shutouts. You were dominating every team you played. So, okay, um, I'm gonna go with blended. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Adam Sandler gets a divorce movie. and he's forced to go on a blind date. And um, my team that I'm going to pick for this is going to be the um, Broncos. And I think they've been in this blended trap for a couple of years now. Uh, they had to divorce. Peyton Manning wanted a divorce and uh, he decided to marry retirement. And the Broncos have been flirting with people. And basically, I feel like this season is a blind date with Teddy Bridgewater. And um, I think it was great at first. They were making good conversation and having a good time and winning games against bad teams. And then I think um, I think that the Broncos might have done something that, that was a little bit unattractive to their date, Teddy Bridgewater. And the two have just been off since then. Um, I think that their chemistry – um, of I would say coaching to quarterback is not great and it just looks like they were the team that could beat bad teams but a semi-decent team comes into mile high and they can't compete I mean they got blown out by John Gruden list Raiders um, Teddy Bridgewater is not the guy next date I don't think Drew Lark's the guy either there. so they got to go way out to find somebody no I mean honestly tank suck um, the quarterbacks are they not... have the offense too, which is kind of sad that they have right. to tank to find somebody. Right. Well, and I think that there are a couple teams like that. Um, 
that are ready for someone to come in and take control. They just need that somebody. Um, I, being the draft guy, have already started a ton of research on the coming draft. And this is a different year where quarterbacks are going to be going 10 to 20 instead of 1 to 10. So um, the Broncos are going to be in that range. If they like someone, they're going to be able to take him. So I think you write it out with Teddy as the Saints have done and as the Panthers have done and add the Broncos to the list. You write it out and then um, you go and you, you get your guy. Me coming up with this topic, I, I shouldn't say me solely. This was kind of Andrew Brewer, new to TSW. He kind of helped me with it. Uh, but this was really just an excuse for me to say that Uncut Gems is a top five movie ever. And I don't like when people debate me on that because it's just a fact. Um, but the Baltimore Ravens are the Uncut Gems of the NFL. Why do I say that? Uncut Gems was an Adam Sandler movie not made by Adam Sandler's people. You don't have to mute yourself, man. Like, we all know what you're doing anyways. Uh, you said you were eating. That's why we had to wait. Okay, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, so Lamar Jackson, obviously the star. Adam Sandler was the main star of Uncut Gems, and we knew that. Kevin Garnett, too, but I'll get into him and his comparison in a little bit. But Uncut Gems was mostly people that have been around other places. You know, Adina Manziel was in there. Uh, Lakis Stanfield from Atlanta and a bunch of other great movies recently but you didn't know too many people on the Ravens I felt like and we were like oh are they just going to be another you know make it into the first round and exit and we know what we're going to get out of Lamar but then like Lamar Adam Sandler totally gave us a career defining performance Lamar's doing things we didn't know he could he can actually pass in the pocket because who knew he could do that and then the stars who we didn't know yet are, you know, now stars, Hollywood Brown, Mark Andrews, we knew he's kind of a Kevin Garnett ask. I don't know. That's the best way I can make the comparison because we all knew like their defense, but no one really on offense. Cause it was kind of who wants to be here injuries, you know, Kevin Garnett had his struggles in uh, the whatever 2007 playoffs or whenever on cut jobs was. So yeah, great ending though. Maybe I, I mean, if Uncut Gems ends how Baltimore ends this year, that might be kind of bad. But. Yeah. Thoughts? I like it. I think that's a good pick. And uh, Uncut Gems is a top three movie ever. So don't be disrespectful. Someone who gets it. All right, this is where the money's made. Week seven, give me a game, Bryce, that we should all be watching on Sunday or Monday or Thursday. Well, I'm going to hand this one off to Tolva as I uh, quickly and frantically search its schedule. So, uh oh, ladies and gentlemen, is the FB analyst not the man we thought he was? <laughs> oh, calm down. I, I'm just, this is <laughs> what the tabloids are going to run with, Bryce. I'm trying to protect you. I'm your biggest ally all right, in this. All right, all right. Well, here we go. Packers Cardinals. Mon good Monday night game. I think that it's too. Ex they don't play on that? Monday night. Thursday. Oh shoot! shoot Thursday of right week there. eight. Yes, yes. Are we going week seven? Yep. Yeah. Never mind. Well, yeah, it is um, week seven. I don't know why we talk about week eight yet. Well, I mean, right, I could. <laughs> all right, Chiefs Titans. Okay. That's my no. Uh, I don't think the Chiefs' defense has been up to par lately, so I could see another big game from A.J. Brown and Derrick Henry. I think the Chiefs' offense is going to obliterate Titans' defense, like probably like Buffalo should have, passing all over their injured secondary with Caleb Farley out now. So I think we could have a big game from Patrick Mahomes and probably Tyreek Hill. I don't know. I I think I don't think Caleb Farley was like as important last night as people would think. I mean, they have Jack Rabbit Jenkins who just gets picked on, but Breon Borders wasn't bad. Um, and no, but they, I'm just saying that's another starter out for Tennessee. Yeah, I mean it is, and that's tough. But they also have Christian Fulton who's playing really well. 
So um, I just like I went from you can't bet against the Chiefs to you don't know what Chiefs team you're going to see. And uh, that's a little bit concerning to me. Okay, I don't think that there are any games where I'm like, this is the game of the week. We can't miss this one. So bear with me here. I don't need to hear from the peanut gallery until I'm done. St. Seahawks Monday night in Seattle. Geno Smith and the Seahawks and Jameis Winston and the Saints. But um, the Saints get almost everyone back. Of course, Michael Thomas decides he needs a couple more weeks on PUP. But we get Traquan Smith back, and he will immediately be our best uh, wide receiver in the room. We're getting three offensive linemen starters back, left tackle Teron Armstead, left guard Andres Pete, center Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz will shift back to right guard, and our staple at right tackle, Ryan Ramchak, will be in place. Um, and so I think we get a little bit more firepower, and Callaway is going to be matched up on – cornerback twos now and Deonta Harris is going to get chances from the slot so Traquan Smith is going to take over as our wide receiver one and he's going to do better and then the whole the cavalry is back on defense Marcus Davenport is our best pass rusher right now he's back David Onyemata our best um, pass rushing interior defensive lineman he had six and a half sacks last season he's back from suspension he um, is going to provide a big boost um, interior presence in the pass rush. We get Quan Alexander back. He's our second best linebacker. Um, we're just getting all these pieces back at the right time. And I'm just, I'm excited to see a healthy Saints team, but this is um, a Seahawks team that I don't think is going to go down easy. I think it's going to be a good game and it's going to be telling. Um, that's why really why it's my game of the week. How good are these, these New Orleans Saints going to be with their kicker back? with a lot of defensive and offensive starters back. And um, can the Seahawks team stay alive enough to get to a wild card spot without Russell Wilson? So I think we just get a lot of answers from this game. I'm glad that they're finally coming back. Because... I'm not sure it's a, as big of a game for Seattle as he's saying, because you're down Russell Wilson, you're down – Chris Carson already you have no passing or running game right now so and they have no defense so I think the Saints just crush them on offense hmm. and they have no first round pick so yes that's true when when do they ever well not last year this year you're like the Miami Heat of the NFL <laughs> or the uh -huh. or the Rams since McVay took over that's true yeah, God, they despise first round picks over in LA. I'm I mean, surprised. It's not like the Seahawks would have done anything with it. Jordan Brooks, Rashad Penny, and uh, Jake, LJ Collier. Yeah. It's probably best they don't have one. I'm surprised neither of you two picked Bengals Ravens. I was thinking about it. I just think that the Ravens are going to crush them. Oh, yeah, they will. I don't I'm know. Not even hating on Bengals. Uh, team either but the Ravens yeah. are just miles ahead of Cincy I'm not a Bengals hater I like the Bengals I just think they're going to get embarrassed I want to see what the Bengals learn in two weeks from the Packers and see if they can learn from that loss at home and maybe try to convert it to success against Baltimore in a game that you could say means more yeah I mean, I think they've the Bengals are a tough team. I don't think they go down as easily as we're used to. Um, but I think that their only hope here against the Ravens is getting into a shootout. And the Ravens is one of the last teams I want to get into a shootout with. But they have the firepower to hang. C.J. Uzama as their ultra-athletic tight end and then their star receiving core with Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins. And then, of course, Joe Mixon. So maybe uh, if they can they can control the clock, run the ball with Joe Mixon, and then um, score early and often, then, then maybe they have a chance. But I'm right, taking a gander at all the games this week. What division leader that's playing on Sunday should be on upset watch? Bryce kind of said it with the Chiefs and Titans. 
So you think mm. they they might be the Titans only one kind of on thin ice? Well, because yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of number one teams that I mean, lose this week. So the Cardinals are playing the Texans, and that's going to be JJ Watt and D Hop's revenge game. The Bears, Bucks, the Bears beat the Bucks last year, and Tom Brady's out for revenge. Green Bay is playing Washington. I don't want to hear it. Cowboys, Vikings, maybe, maybe the Vikings could squeak one out. Uh, the Chargers are up against the Patriots. I expect a slaughter fest there. I mean, I guess it, you could say the Ravens with the Bengals, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Dallas. I think Dallas is an, on up, upset watch against the Vikings. I just think the Vikings have enough firepower to make it interesting. Mr. Martino? Yeah, I just got to stick with the Titans here. I mean, like I said before, there's not a lot of great games this week where there's going to be an upset of a number one team. I think Titans are – is it Chiefs or Titans is in first place? But um, I just think they're in Titans. for a loss this week. Yeah. The Chiefs are in last place in their division, I believe. Yes, you're right. Yeah, they're tied for third with Denver. Tied right? for last, yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're only a game behind uh, Oakland or Oakland, Las Vegas. Uh, Vegas, who is tied with the Chargers. Yeah. So, I mean, well, and you look ahead at the Chiefs' schedule, they got Titans, and then they have the Packers, and they have the Cowboys coming up. And the Chargers again, they'll have the Bengals eventually. Like, there are a couple more losses on that schedule. So, I don't know. I think it's time to worry a little bit about KC. Yeah, I mean, Mahomes is trying to play hero ball right now, and it's starting to catch up with him a little bit. I mean, that intercept, that second interception when he was falling down, I just think it wasn't that great of a play. At all. That, that wasn't Patrick Mahomes football. No, it wasn't. You're used to the no look uh sideline throws to Travis Kelsey and you're you're getting like balls thrown two feet in the air when he's falling down, so this is kind of a new thing. Rarely if ever, I feel like in was it almost eight months we never have time to like really wrap it up so Bryce what's one thing that you've wanted to say about the season but for some reason whether it be rerun out of time or you just haven't been able to get it in what's one thing about the season that you haven't gotten to say yet but now you can the Lions are a good football team yes they their record doesn't show it but you gotta look deeper than that they've won or Excuse me. They've lost close games to very good teams. They lost to Niners and uh, the Vikings in very, very close fashion. I think Dan Campbell is doing a very good job with building that team. Uh, Jared Goff's playing better than I expected him to with their lack of receivers. So it's got to be Detroit. Um, before I say this, I'd like to say I'm a Saints fan. I'm not a Cowboys fan. I hate the Cowboys. I think that the Cowboys are contenders this year with this new and improved defense. Um, the, the whole next man up thing has kind of always been big to me with the Cowboys because I feel like they always had starters and then some, that, that guy who would fill in when people inevitably got injured. I was really upset when DeMarcus Lawrence got injured earlier this season because he was so good in the season opener. Randy Gregory has come out guns blazing. And surprising um, to me. He's got four sacks right now. He had two last week. Micah Parsons has two and a half. And then someone on that D-line who's been really impressive to me has been Osa Odigizua, the um, rookie from UCLA. I think it was a fourth-round pick. He's playing their three technique right now. And he's um, top five in rookie pressures right now. So I think they have a good linebacker core right now with Parsons and Vander Esch. Uh, Their D-line's looking nice. And then their corners are hanging. 
And uh, that's really what's important to me. And then obviously CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Dalton Schultz is playing out of his mind. Um, once Gallup's healthy and uh, Cedric Wilson is playing well. And then obviously the two-headed monster of Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. And uh, I think Dak is an MVP candidate this year. It wasn't obvious the whole podcast, but I'm wearing my Julie Ertz headband. Uh, Zach Ertz is going to go crazy in the desert. Everybody does. It's a great place. I love sand and cacti. Yeah, why don't you put your Cardinals hat on like you do every podcast? We just yeah, we said, need um, pens right now. We just said it, but in passing in about the wrong week. And we all know where my loyalties lie. Me and my boy, Ty Wellman. The Jets. <laughs> no, no, we're me and Ty are all for the Cardinals. If you don't know, I defended the Cardinals honor. Uh, the FB analyst about two weeks ago. And I made a friend well, for everyone. I think they're better than last year's six and zero Steelers, but I I have a gut feeling that there there's going to be a collapse somewhere mid season, late season, something like Frank that. Maybe not as playoffs. grand as the Steelers, but like they just can't sustain this. They can't. You're going to see a slight uh, decrease of production from that offense. I think. Yeah. Well, and like last week, the Browns looked like they didn't want to win. So. They really don't have a running game right now and a lot of their or a couple of their receivers are getting pretty old so they don't use Rondale more half as much as they should like he's no. still the fourth wide receiver and that goes back AJ to... Green's getting more product or more playing time than him and that's just absurd screw Cliff anyway Steven take us away Cliff's a great guy and he's the only man that I'll respect that doesn't wear socks with expensive shoes. One thing I haven't gotten to say in the month and a half of the season is I really like doing this with you guys. I hope everyone's enjoying listening. Watch on YouTube. It's way better there. I promise. Apple or Spotify. If you don't have, you know, the capability to watch a video at whatever time, uh, the FBI analyst, the sports wave official kickers corner, uh, the exam podcast. I think I plugged everything. 